Welcome to Money on Tap. Money on Tap, your personal finance headquarters, where we bring out the professionals' experience and some fun in what we call three-dimensional investing, utilizing insurance, brokerage, and fee-based planning. That's what we do on this show. We look at all sides of the issues, and we bring a fully independent planning perspective to the table. Welcome back. You're listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. Calm. So good to be here with you today. Uh, we have a heck of a show here for you. Uh, my name is Seth Crossman, and I'm here once again with Ben Brayshaw and Dan Mickelin. How are you guys doing? I'm doing great, Seth. How about you, Dan? Doing really good. Excited about the holiday season. Let's get into it. You know, Hopefully you don't go bankrupt buying me gifts this year. Well, you know, I got plenty of room on that credit card, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you sure? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, speaking of holidays, ho, 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 how do you afford Christmas is the topic today. We've got some great, um, well, we've got some great experience as well we're willing to share with you, but also we've got some advice here, some some ways that you can, um, you know, bring home the bacon, so to speak, uh, for the holidays. And uh, it, it's going to be, I don't think we've ever done this show. Do you? Nope. Do you remember ever doing the show? Well, I think this will be a first. This will be a first. Cool. A new content. Or, you know, as always, we're, it's always new content here with us. We're, we're always bringing it to you with uh, the best of three-dimensional investing, uh, your personal finance headquarters. That's what we're doing here at Money on Tap. If you're new to Money on Tap, welcome. We're glad to have you aboard. All of us are financial planners with Brayshaw Financial Group. And what we do is, uh, outside of this podcast, is we do financial planning. And we talk here on this podcast and this radio show about three-dimensional investing. We're going to take a look at all sides of the issue and bring home to you some great uh, suggestions and recommend- recommendations from our experience working within personal finance and retirement planning. And uh, this is going to be fun for us today. Yeah, you know, I think, I think one of the things that we really, we really see a lot of people struggle with is trying to balance the financial world around them. And the holiday season makes it tremendously difficult because there's so much pressure on people each and every day to either travel somewhere, get to family, get family to them that can't afford to get to, you know, like in gifts and, you know, big dinners. And I mean, it's just, there's a lot of money that is, that is put out on these holiday seasons. I mean, I was walking through... I don't know if it was Target or Walmart, and it wasn't even Halloween yet, and they had Christmas stuff out. I mean, yeah. like, they totally skipped Thanksgiving. That's so quick. I mean, the, the marketing is, is relentless, and it starts earlier and earlier every year. You know, so uh, it, it's good. I mean, like, getting into the holiday spirit and all that, but it also you know, gets the wheels turning in everyone's minds, I think, and the, kind of the stress begins early, you know, the factoring in, you know, where am I going, how much is it going to cost, you know, who are we entertaining, and, um, you know, that's around the, the normal challenges of just figuring out a list and who are we going to buy, you know, who are we going to buy for and what are they going to get? You know, it just is an overwhelming time of year, you know, particularly when we're dealing with inflation and rising costs and, and kind of the circumstances of the day that I think make this Christmas a little bit unique and a little bit more stressful than most. Well, stress or no stress, I guess that's one of the things that we can try to uh, check the box on here is like, let's take it down for you guys. Let's bring it down a notch and let's get some solutions in place. But before we get going down that road, it is time for Money in the News. And first article of the day, we got, well, the first question Bob Iger must answer is Disney's CEO. And this is from Alexandra Canal from Yahoo Finance. And if you've been following the news, the financial news anyway lately, there was a big move over at Disney where the uh, present CEO, not very long, was was fired and let go. And they brought back Bob Iger, who had been the CEO previously and had you know significantly more success in the role. Uh, Disney's been in the news a lot. We've kind of covered that lately here on the show. A lot of it having to do with, you know, kind of the uh, political stuff around education and, and the kind of squabbles between Disney, the entity, and the governor there in Florida. Uh, but this is a little bit different. You know, I think this will be 
probably welcome local local yeah. news for sure, um, kind of bringing back in Iger. But really the, the focus of the article and the, and the changes to be expected to help Disney uh, better perform are less related to the political stuff and uh, more to do with their streaming services. Yeah, they lost $8 billion uh, <laughs> in their streaming services, and they're expected to lose another $3 billion in the first quarter of, uh, of next year. And it's, you know, for a world that people are streaming more and more, you know, and, and the streaming industry alone is expected to have some losses in the first quarter. I mean, that is kind of an expected scenario. But, I mean, for a stock like Disney, which was up in the high 100s, like 185 or, you know, 190 even, I think. Um, I don't, did it cross 200? I think it did, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so, and now it's trading at below 100. So it's, it's like almost half off. So the question is, is what's going on? There's been a lot of racket about, um, both the agenda of you know what has happened in Disney. I mean that's been a big conversation. I know a lot of a lot of organizations and conservative people have dropped Disney because of so much of the woke kind of agenda that seems to be coming through on on uh, on their material. So that that has driven. I mean I've just heard huge organizations just selling Disney irrelevant of everything. Um, and then to have a streaming hit like this, I mean that is probably. I think potentially part of that story too. I mean, there's a big conservative, you know, push against Disney, and I think that they're experiencing a portion of that because they're outpacing the downward trend of of the general <laughs> of the general streaming world for an organization that is literally content and entertainment driven only. Like they are the pinnacle name, you know, uh, of 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 video content. You know, when, when, you know, first off, the stocks responded to the news, by the way, you know, it's up yeah. about 10% in the last yeah. few days, you know, based upon this change of leadership. But when, you know, streaming really started becoming a kind of an everyday thing, you know, I remember having this conversation with you. I know I discussed with my wife, like mm -hmm. Disney had just had such a great position over the whole field because they already owned content. You know, they yeah. had this massive volume, voluminous library of just endless entertainment that they already owned had already been built had already been filmed you know so for them to somehow manage to not you know hold that top spot in the streaming world is you know something's going wrong there yeah no exactly it's it's just a completely fundamental you know breakdown on on, on i mean you're right i mean they they literally have the most content in the most languages as well yeah everyone else is going to go and make stuff right netflix is going to go produce movies and shows and and prime and, and all their competitors you know, you know, so for them to enter the market with thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of content that they know sells. I mean, this stuff is all hits, you know. Uh, so for them to somehow screw that up, you know, there's something going on. There. I, I really do believe that they're experiencing a lot of headwind from the conservative side of this. I, I think they really are. I think m way more than they're even going to give credit to. So, Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting when you t start taking a look at – What's happened in the relationship here with the market and uh, Disney and some of those, you know, some of those stories that have come across our desk around Disney and their political stances and, and the direction that the company is going. It's, um, it's interesting to see when we went back to the 2020, it was like an $87 stock. Um, and that was, you know, COVID related in the fall off there. Uh, but there was no question about whether or not you were buying Disney at a hundred bucks, you know. And now to take a look at what the price is today at around, you know, it depends on the day, roughly ninety, ninety seven, a hundred dollars again. Is Disney one of those places where you feel like it's going to continue to produce a success, successful story? Um, how they've botched, I guess, is the the, the term around streaming. It's I'm really curious to find that out as well because, again, the the catalog that you're talking about that they have, the names like Marvel and all of this stuff. I mean, just turn on the – I assume you have Disney Plus as a streaming service. If you just turn it on, it's like what what don't you have there? You could – I mean, there's something there for everybody, and then it's so, and it's such a vast library. It gets me to almost just completely – cancel any net you know netflix subscription or anything else out there that's producing content but i don't know i'm really curious to find out what's going on there and i, I mean as as a whole i'm we're still a disney family we're still buying disney and we're still you know investing our <laughs> ourselves probably more than we should into the disney story yeah i mean and the other thing is so that is the disney 
plus streaming service, which we're all familiar with. I mean, you get your Star Wars there, all the, the children's shows. I mean, just tremendous, timeless content. You know, but they also have ESPN and Hulu, and you know, ESPN's had its ups and downs for sure. You know, but Hulu is a you know that's my streaming service. You know, that's where I get my TV. I think it's a great deal. And um, so, you know, one of the potential remedies here is is some kind of a combination of the three separate services, which I think you know potentially makes sense for them. It's interesting because I was at, you know I subscribed to you know Disney and. I think Disney came with my Verizon plan. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so I got Disney and I've got Netflix, but I've also got PureFlix, which is like a like a kind of like just a generally good content. It's supposed to be like religious based, Christian based. I, and they actually have some pretty decent content too, and some of the kind of the pop culture Christian movies and stuff like that. But so, I mean, content is content, and it's 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 a driving force for you know where the world's going. So if Disney can't get it figured out, someone's going to. Taylor Swift fans are a little bit miffed, to say the least. Um, you know, the, the the Taylor Swift story is is one that, frankly, I'm I'm not. Come all on, that Seth. Familiar be with. honest. Come on, you're a big fan. We know. Well, you're I'm a, gonna look to my. I'm gonna look over here to my ten year old daughter. You're and a probably, Swifty. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't get tickets either. Yeah, so the story there has been big in the news lately. Um, you know, obviously, she crashed Ticketmaster, right? They were attempting to <laughs> sell tickets to a show, as they're supposed to. And there was such tremendous demand that it just absolutely sunk the whole website and and left people, you know, with really no avenue to pursue to get these tickets. And it was just a total blackout for a while. Well, I literally was driving around with my daughter and her friend, and she was they were both home for college for Thanksgiving, and, you know, we're t- chatting, and she's talking about... How she was? She's a Swifty, a a recognized fan of Taylor Swift, and so she's got a special code. And she was telling me, I hadn't even heard about it. She's like, "Oh yeah," she's like, "I was on, I was um waiting for like four hours, and my code wasn't working." And like, you have a special. She was explaining the whole thing to me, like you got this code, and you're like on the thing, and you can't. But her code wasn't working, and a lot of people's codes weren't working. So you were given a kind of a pre-purchase code, the priority purchasing power. <clears throat> like you are a Swifty, and. You get to buy first, and she said, people were like people were on there for even tw- you know another fifty percent six hours. She said she knew somebody was on and, and still didn't get tickets. So it is kind of interesting, but there's a huge movement by a number of fans, Swift fans, who are attorneys who have now gathered together. I think twelve hundred attorneys, right? Have got you know this article talks about twelve hundred attorneys have gotten together to sue. You know, Ticketmaster and basically the monopoly that exists around this since they bought out. What was the other uh, t- uh, ticket company they bought out? It was um, Ticketmaster. Uh, yeah, Ticketmaster bought out another ticket company, and then there's not, not SeatGeek. No, I can't remember what it was. But anyways, it was um, they bought out another ticket company, and so now they control eighty percent of all ticket sales. <clears throat> and they're saying this, you know, this is a uh, this is a major problem from the monopoly thing. The only thing I got as I was reading this story was that, you know, watching Gen Zers get ignited over Taylor Swift to actually take major, major action. I was thinking to myself, how can we actually replicate this in the business world? <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you could find anything else that has 1,200 lawyer fans. You know, that's, that's, that's a big number. That's a big number. But, it, I mean, it literally crashed their system left and right. And, and some of the fallout from this, and, and I'm not a Swifty, so I wasn't exactly you know following the story with bated breath. But uh, I did see some interesting news come forward about this dynamic pricing, which is which is part of Ticketmaster's issue here, where they'll you know launch ticket sales of a given show, you know preset at whatever the, the the general pricing would be, you know based upon you know how close and how good the tickets are. Uh, but once they hit the market, the pricing begins to evolve based upon you know volume of sales and how many people are competing for a given seat and the prices can absolutely skyrocket and that's what we saw a lot of here is just prices going up three four five hundred percent instantaneously wow. based upon front those. row front row seats at taylor swift were selling for thirty thousand dollars whoa thirty thousand dollars a ticket that is crazy yeah and you know 
I can't imagine anybody willing to pay it, but apparently there are. Um, but I, I did see a sort of kind of follow up interviews with other artists who use Ticketmaster and this dynamic pricing. You know, one of them was Bruce Springsteen, and he um, you know, he commented, you know, a couple of things, you know, that I thought were interesting and, and more truthful than I expected to hear, quite honestly. But you know, he essentially said he's been, you know, in his opinion, discounting ticket sales for over his long career, and you know, him and the band are kind of getting towards the end of the touring rope, perhaps, and you know, his perspective on it was, well, you know, everybody else is doing this and kind of reaping the benefits. So we figured we'd give it a shot this time around. And as well, you know, these, these inflated ticket prices, you know, rather than go into the pockets of scalpers and people who work in the secondary seating market, you know, why shouldn't it go to the artist was his perspective, which again, you know, I still wouldn't spend the money. I'm not necessarily a Springsteen fan, but I did find that to be kind of a a more honest than expected answer. Yeah, so it was Live Nation was who uh, they merged with. So mer- uh, Live Nation and Ticketmaster merged in 2010, um, and then that created the antitrust issue with the monopolies. And and so and then they've started creating this dynamic pricing, which has sent this whole thing into craziness. And it's kind of interesting. I mean, when you think about it, it's. I mean, I get the fact that hey, these tickets sell, and then they keep marking it up, and that actually happens in art. I, you know, so if you like, there's. Uh, I was at this walking by. I saw this beautiful ocean art, and I was like, "Oh, that's a super interesting." I just want to go in and look. And they were selling these photographs for large amounts of money, which were outrageous in my mind. But at the end of the day, when we were, she was explaining to me, she's like, "Well, this is the first one that would sell." So, you know, this one sells for X thousands of dollars, and I was like, "Oh, okay." She's like, "Yeah, but when the last of the twenty that sold in this." group sold for X of tens of thousands and this one sold for X of hundreds of thousands. So by the time it's – so every time they sell, they keep marking the next one up by a percentage point based on how fast it sells as well. So like if you buy one and then someone buys one immediately right after, the price jumps a certain level. But if you sell one and it's like two months later one sells, it might not jump as much. And when you get a thousand – well, not a thousand, thousands of people in a waiting room online – you know, with a credit card handy and, you know, just feverish to get the hands on tickets, you can see how some gouging's probably taking place there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, actually, this, uh, for a second, I thought you were talking about Elton John, um, just because he was saying farewell to the U.S. and live, uh, doing any kind of live performing arts. Elton John will no longer be a stage presence, at least not in the U.S., uh, as of this last week, his final show at Dodger Stadium. I just saw that pop up. But no, you were talking about Bruce Springsteen. Should I sing some Bruce Springsteen for us to take us into the next article, or are we good? We we'll say we're good. Yeah, I think we're all right. I think <laughs> we'll be all right. <laughs> next up, um, this is Will Daniel. I'm just going to jump right in here and save our audience the painstaking <laughs> event. Um, the bear market will end early next year and create a terrific buying opportunity. Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson says. Now, if anyone knows who Mike Wilson is, he is not a, an optimist. No, no, no. <laughs> he is not an optimist whatsoever at all. So for him to uh, for him to start talking about how good the market's going to look next year was a shocker for a lot of us to read and something that has gotten a lot of uh, headwind um, in a lot of ways because he has been so negative on so many things. But he doesn't leave the, the event without talking about negativity, though. He does say that... Doom and gloom is coming, and it's coming in the first quarter. Be prepared to see the S&P down in the low 3,000s, which I've heard a lot of people talk about. There's a lot of, there's a lot of um, fundamental analysis that actually says that there's a support level in the low 3,000s between the 3,000 and the 3,300, which is what he notes in his conversation. Um, what, what's interesting is, is he says that this bear market rally – you know, caps out around 4150 on the S&P 500, which is kind of an interesting number in its own right. What do you think, Dan? Yeah, I mean, true to form, he doesn't let you, you know, walk away from a read or watching him with any kind of uh Like you're you know, like, oh, it's going to go up comfort. and, oh, no, we're going to crash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, you know, good news is this return's coming. But before we get there, you know, he, he's going to let you know that there's, there's more pain to be felt. And, you know, it, it is, you know, I wouldn't say anything's true consensus these days, but, um, you know, a lot of what we read – you know, kind of would lean towards the fact that earnings are still high in the S and P, and they're expected to take, you know, kind of a hit here between end of the fourth quarter, beginning of the first. Um, 
you know, and I think a lot of that just has to do with the general recession fears. Although, you know, similarly, there's a lot of consensus around the fact that, you know, whatever pain we feel there will be short lived and the bounce back will be pretty good. Well, you know, I think I think there's there's lots of different types of investing. So depending on what type of investing you're doing and whether you're in a diversified portfolio or just an equity portfolio, there's a lot of moving parts there. And I know this is just money in the news, but I think this is important enough to share. You know, we you know we have a blue chip portfolio, a value portfolio that this actually references. The blue chip space has been hit. Um, we actually our portfolio has been up year to date, which is uh, net of fees, which is you know great, and it's it's actually amazing in this marketplace. But we have other portfolios that are down, who are diversified and kind of the generic like trying to be as passive as you can with a little bit of technical management, which we've beaten the market pretty well, um, but it's still down. And so there's a lot of different moving parts here that um, push people in different directions. So you've really got to be careful in the type of portfolio when you're watching this advice and this guy's talking about how to do because we talked about on our last show that historically 19 out of the last 19 midterm elections, so 100% of the time, the market's been up 12 months later. And matter of fact, it's been up at an average of over 16%. Now, Six months after a midterm election, it's been up over 15% on average, not all of them positive, right? So, so it's kind of interesting that we've got all of these different moving pieces that people are talking about, and there's a lot of opportunistic items available. When do you get back in if you're sitting on the sidelines? When do you actually decide to commit? And I think that's really where people are, you know, are scared because there is a lot of money on the sidelines. And I think you know, kind of waiting for that 3300 to come, it may never happen. And that's kind of the hard piece of of this conversation. Seth, I think you wanted to say something. I can see it on your face. Sure. Yeah. I was going to say, when, you know, the question of when do you get back in um, as an investor, it, you know, picking your spots sometimes may never happen. Sometimes you're just, you know, you're you're at, you have to be as an investor, you have to take a look at the big picture and say, yeah, we're off of our high. Yes, we've gone back up, and yes, we may come back down. And you start taking positions incrementally. It's a dollar cost averaging is is what it boils kind of comes back into as an investor. Is just taking positions and not being an all in, all out. You know, this is not a you know roulette table, folks. You're not all on black, all on red, or or whatever. This is this is this is where you you go ahead and you take a look at big picture. We probably have some some more. News coming down the the pipe that fire and ice of you know the slowing down of the economy, the raising of rates, the you know slowing down of some of these companies, you know there's still you know twenty percent too high as far as you know their 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 corporate earning estimates is is what those projections look like, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's not a time for you to take a part of or take a step into. Because again, like Ben, you were saying, do, do we come back? Does it pull back? These guys don't know. They're just and, and and nobody really does. But what we do know is we do know that it was a lot heck of a lot higher. And we do know over time, what's the market going to do? It's it's going to come back. I mean, that's one of the things that history has shown us over and over. I mean, it's been said it's a, that's the guarantee of the market is it will go up over time. So let's go ahead and break there, folks. That's it for money in the news. Cannot wait to come back to you with more money on tap. Ho, ho, ho. How do you afford Christmas? is the topic for today. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. Folks, we have a lot of fun doing this show, uh, Money on Tap, and uh, and Ben and I have been financial planners for years and years, and our goal here with you is to bring you into the room, have the conversations that we have. We think these are critical conversations for you, but we understand this is a limited space, and what we'd love to do is to open the doors to you with us at Brayshaw Financial Group. So you could experience what it means to have three-dimensional planning in your life. Let's take a look at all sides of your situation, your scenario, and see how we can put together the best plan possible, taking into account your risk, how much 
can you have in the market? How much do we need to have set aside and doing different things for your life? That's what we do as planners, how we engage with you. And we welcome you to do that with us. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. Now, if you have $250,000 that are investable assets today, our planning is free to you. We want you to have the playbook to have a successful experience in retirement. Give us a call, 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. Ben and I welcome you to Brayshaw Financial for complete wealth management. We appreciate you listening to Money on Tap with Ben, Seth, and Dan. You can contact us at 855-226-8551 or email us at info at yourmoneyontap.com. And now, more of this week's program. Welcome back. You're listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. We're talking about ho, 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 how do you afford Christmas? This year, maybe more of the the uh that might be more of the the topic of conversation that folks had around that thanksgiving table um looking at some of those black friday deals a little bit more closely and probably doing a little bit different planning this year for christmas than they have in the most recent year uh you know i you know this didn't even really come up as a topic but just the government not giving people money this year that i'm aware of probably made a bit of a difference for people you think? That's horrible. That's... <laughs> it's not the government's money, Seth. I'm not buying other people's Christmas gifts. A little Santa stimulus? Is that, is that in order? <laughs> oh, gosh. You guys are killing me. Come on, me. Uncle Joe. Come on. Uncle Joe. Listen, okay, so folks, we've got nearly 217 million Americans. I'm just moving right past you boys. If you sit in his lap, you'll get a, you'll get a check for that. Oh, right? <laughs> That's horrible. Cut that. <laughs> <laughs> Cut that down. Okay, nearly 217 million Americans, 84% of people plan to buy their gifts for their friends, loved ones, and those they hate <laughs> <laughs> on a credit card this year, folks. That is crazy. And the average shopper plans to spend $823, a total of one point, I'm sorry, $178 billion in gift spending in the United States alone. Absolutely incredible. You know, I'd, I'd probably never even attempted to think of quantifying that, but to, to see it there in black and white, that is an absolutely astronomical shopping spree we're all about to go on here. Yeah, someone needs to live a little tiny Tim is what I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so this is this is crazy. This is crazy. So, you know, some of the some of the statistics around here are pretty pretty astronomical. So, close to a third of last year's holiday shoppers are still in debt from the previous season. A third, so a third are still paying down last holiday. I mean, I mean, forget, forget, just like your bills, the last holiday season. Yeah, you know, it's. I think people go into this optimistically because around some of those credit stats, I saw that you know seventy percent or so of people who spend on credit, you know, go into it with the goal of spending it, you know, paying off their credit card debt in that first statement that comes through, but. You know, those two numbers don't drive at all. Reality sets in and people just simply don't get around to doing it. Yeah, that's a tough nut. I'm curious how many of those of that third are carrying holiday debt from the previous year or the previous year. If that's just a rolling number for them and that's just kind of a lifestyle um, or if that is a factor of where we're at just in this, you know, contraction in our economy. And that's just a, a just kind of a, a hangover from that. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a really good point, Seth. And then the thing is, is that we, I mean, we meet so many people that do things so uniquely different. But I know, a, I do know a number of people I've talked to over, you know, my career. And, you know, there's people who have like a holiday credit card. Like they have a card they only use for holidays and birthdays and so forth. And that's how they manage their finances. Kind of like the old, 
you know, kind of envelope system. You know, like people would put cash in an envelope and go out and buy groceries or do this or do that. It's like they have their credit card, like this is the holiday credit card. I think it's a little bit more difficult now when you have like Amazon and you're buying thousands of things on Amazon. You're like, oh, yeah, and I'm going to get this Christmas gift. By the way, guys, I'm going to send you both my list. So it is long. <laughs> it is intensive, but I expect it to be filled. hope it's on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Just know I've already gotten you your present, Ben. Oh, it's it's in the mail. Did did you all hear that? And it's not, it was, and it's it not my sing, fault if it, it doesn't arrive. It was a singular item. It wasn't presents. It was a present. <laughs> oh, I miss I, I misspoke. I meant presents. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is crazy. So, um, nearly three quarters of shoppers will buy their gifts on a credit card, charging an average of six hundred and sixty three dollars. I I think it's just it's just astonishing to me that the numbers are are this high, like, and for some people, it's significantly higher. And that really brings us to our first conversation about how to make Christmas affordable. Um, the number one thing about Christmas is that you have to be organized and an organization around Christmas is more than decorations and preparing for people to come, but it's kind of an overall spending commitment. Like what are you willing to spend on Christmas and doing a budget? Sorry, you know, big B word budget, but really understanding. And I think, I thought this was funny. One of the things that came came out was creating a list of people that you were going to buy for and then put a value to the relationship. (laughs) Did you put that down there, (laughs) Dan? I'm calling your wife. (laughs) I think that's actually pretty interesting. But, I mean, there's (laughs) there's some value to Dan's statement here. But the truth is, is that... When it really comes to, to pricing, I just gotta, I just gotta tell you, this is so funny because now we're we, part of the shows that we've done in the past is like, what's the value of life, and and it, you know, from a perspective of what we do all the time of trying to help people understand how much life insurance is appropriate and what's the value of life. Now we have a value of your relationship show we can pull out next. Yeah, can't exactly. wait to see how you do this, Dan. Yeah, what, no. teach us. <laughs> I will be your Padawan. <laughs> So 51% of Americans typically say or feel they overspend around the holidays, and that number is $832. And I think on average, when you start really breaking that down and you really figure out, hey, listen, for Christmas, this is how much I'm going to spend, or as a married couple, like this is how much I'm going to spend, I would include food, you know, you know, beyond the gifts. Like, you know, what are you doing for dinner? Like, how many people are you having? You know, are you overspending? Like, my wife and I actually literally had to make a decision when we were newly married because we both really liked getting together with people was we realized that we were spending so much food, so much money on food, having people over, even though people were helping because people bring like they bring a pie, but you end up, you know, but you're providing the extra hors d'oeuvres or someone forgot the drinks or, you know, whatever. And you're, you're always taking on more expense hosting. So that's a conversation to have with other people in your family, just say, hey, listen, we have a specific budget. And it gives a good conversation and a healthy conversation to say, we have a budget on what we're spending on Christmas. And so what I've done is, is this is what we're going to spend on the food. And if you could help us out with this, this is what we're going to prepare. You know, and so it, it, it shows thought and it doesn't, it doesn't come across wrong, in my opinion, when you actually do it. I mean, any conversation around a budget is, is, you know, kind of puts people in defensive posture, I think, in general. But there's certainly ways to do it. And, and, you know, especially if you're dealing with family and friends. I mean, you wouldn't be inviting people who aren't close to you. You know, then, you know. That's I, I presuming think, a lot, Dan, for well, American holidays. <laughs> <laughs> close to it doesn't mean you like them. You know, that's probably <laughs> okay. two different things. But, yeah, I mean, those conversations, you know, particularly in times like these, they just have to be had. And, you know, I think as long as you do it in advance of, then, you know, people – We'll, st- we'll still find a way to get together and have fun and enjoy the times. And budgeting actually includes good lists of like, this is what we're going to do. Like I'm going to have, we're going to have a ham at Christmas or a turkey and we're going to have this, this, and this, and this is what these costs are. And and you start saying to people, hey, I want to do these for dinner and I'm going to need this much and this size tray. And you literally lay it out for everybody. And, you know, for people who can't cook, you just say, here, can you bring, the, you know, really, really get into it. And the fact that you're taking that much conscious effort they understand you're taking this seriously. Everyone knows inflation is here, right? I mean, this is really the reason we're having this conversation. Is inflation's here, and how do you mitigate the cost of the world around us today so that it's like last year or the year before? How does it make it more financially possible? 
Yeah, I mean, we we did a show last week about Thanksgiving uh, costing on average twenty percent more this year. So, um, reasonably safe to assume Christmas will will be the same. And turkeys on, are on sale right now. You know, right. that's the one thing. The, after after a holiday, that's the one piece that you can take advantage of. So maybe now's the time to buy the turkey for Christmas. Yeah, and, and after all this, you know, the, the statistics tell us about thirty seven percent of people actually prepare a budget for Christmas. So. Um, you know, for the rest of us, and you know, I got to put myself in the kind of the larger portion there. You know, just roaming through the mall without a list in mind or a budget in mind, just kind of doing that last second shopping. Um, you know, can certainly be painful. I got to tell you though, my wife's like she's on top of this. I mean, she literally has a dollar amount that she spends on every kid, and then I'll be like, yeah, well, you know, I got this for. Well, she's like, what did you do? Like, <laughs> I've literally have you know. So she has a very organized perspective of the financial piece of that, which is funny because, you know, I'm the financial planner and she's planning this all. So I think that that's really, I do appreciate that a lot about her just organizing that. Um, But she also is very conscious of how many gifts kids are opening too. So with our kids, she wants to make sure she's spending the same amount and that there's at least something for all of them to open at the same time as they're going through it. So someone doesn't feel like they got 10 gifts and someone else got two and you're like, you hate me and. Meanwhile, one person got a computer and somebody else got five Lego sets. Yeah, I, don't, I don't have that at home. My, my problem is, is the opposite. You know, we, we have this conversation early on about, okay, this is what everyone's going to get. You know, and then I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. She's never done. She's never done. <laughs> I've got to tell you, Ben, Kim sounds a lot like my mom, and I mean that in the best way possible. That is exactly how my mom would do things for Christmas for the for any and it still happens to this day for the grandkids and that's just everything is very thought out to the number to the dollar amount and and equal and I can appreciate that that's a really that's a real act of service and love um, now I got a couple of stories here and I need some actually this is this is something that just popped up while we were talking um, this last weekend. But Careful, Augusta folks. That's off script. <laughs> yeah, she had a cheer. She had a cheer competition. So that's not really that, that's neither here nor there. But we, during this big break, we were like, "Well, let's go to Costco and we're going to get our Thanksgiving shopping done." But when we left shop, uh, Costco, and we're checking. First of all, we, we got the bill, and we're like, "Oh my gosh! Like, how many people are we feeding for Thanksgiving?" And um, and it's a fair amount. But anyways, we're just moving on. We got to get back to the cheer competition. We're running late. Got to go see this. And uh, we're checking out. You know how they like take your receipt and they double check what you've got? They're like, well, did you get two tomatoes? And we look at each other. And we're like, no, we didn't. But you know what? How much are tomatoes? we got to go. We'll, we'll come back and whatever. It's like 10 bucks. We'll figure it out. Well, last night we pull out the, the receipt. We spent $150 on tomatoes somehow. <laughs> Apparently we bought two cases or whatever of tomatoes. So... Oh. Folks, that's one way you don't save money for Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> don't buy that many tomatoes. And I don't know, maybe just do a little bit of um, not backed into the corner on your timeline. Give yourself a little bit of time at the checkout stand. And just make sure that you're, 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 you're spending the money on what you wanted to spend the money on. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good point. It's just really being in articulating the gifts. You know, I think... You know, that's, and that's what I was talking about. Like, I, I think there's a lot to be said when you're really caring that much about how much you're spending on somebody and, you know, how many gifts you're doing. All of those things, they communicate other, other forms of love and intent. And I think that's what you were speaking to, Seth, about the ladies there. Um, one of the things that I, you know, one of the things I was thinking about, um, there's two things, there's two ways of saving money for Christmas that have come up in my, in my world. The first one is, is that, Gift cards, which I hate getting gift cards. Everyone in my family knows I hate getting gift cards because I, I don't go out shopping for myself. You know, it's not like, hey, I really want to go hit the mall today. Like, that's just not what I do. Or I want to run over to Best Buy. No, I'm, I'm at work. And by the time I get home, I'm tired. I don't want to go out. So, you know, gift cards are not my thing. But in a world. Not, not Ben's love language. Folks. Not my love <laughs> language. You know, like if you really care about me, you're going to find something I like. You're going to put it, you know. So, but. In reality, looking at this Christmas, gift cards, like if you said, hey, I'm going to spend $100 on mom and dad this year, buying them a gift card, you know, for $100, even to a store that they love or to that makes a lot more sense because guess what, folks? 
post you know post uh, December twenty fifth, everything goes on sale. 20, 30, 40% off. It's crazy deals. And now that $100 gift card can buy them significantly more than maybe you'd be able to give, which would be more in line with the 20% turkey increase cost. And I think that is probably one real area where, you know, you can start mitigating costs, especially if you know your kids really want a specific toy and you say, hey, listen, maybe the toy is more than you want to spend, but you can give them a gift card hoping that the toy is going to be more affordable post Christmas. So, yeah. And I think, you know, a great technique is always, um, you know, if you are, you know, f- for me, I, I, I start out with a list, but I probably do more grazing than I should. And just kind of, you know, walking my way around the racks and, and picking and choosing. But, you know, one thing that's so much easier to do these days is, you know, if you find yourself in that spot and you didn't really get a chance to, to research your gift intents, you know, before you go ahead and check out and buy something, you know, just grab your phone and, and price check it, right? You might be able to find the same exact item someplace else, either online or through another retailer at a significantly lesser cost than, than the one you're holding. So, um, you know, that's how you don't end up with 150 bucks worth of tomatoes, I guess, is, you know, take a couple seconds and check that price and, you know, see if you can't find a better deal someplace else. Dan, that, that right there really hurt my feelings. <laughs> if I had a tomato, I'd be throwing it at you right now. Here's, here's what I have to say about that. The gift card thing, actually, a little off script here again for you guys because that's that's what I love to bring to the show. You know what? We've got this. We, we actually have a collection of gift cards. I don't know if anybody out there, you know, has this like, you know, Ziploc baggie in the drawer oh my in God. the kitchen exactly. or whatever. That's what I do. You, you know what you know what I'm talking about? Yes. You've got all this all these gift cards that you've been given and some of them are for restaurants and some of them for for whatever. But you know what we take is we, we take those gift cards and we go out and we specifically have the intention of using the gift cards to try to purchase the presents for people in on our lists. Okay, so they're getting used. And Ben, I, I, I apologize. Part of your gifts that are on the way just might be some gift cards. And for Ben, you know, his love language is really just the anticipation of receiving a gift. So what I'm going to give to Ben is is let him know for the rest of the year that, you know, it's in the mail so that he feels that he's always being thought of throughout the year. There's also that person in your gift giving as well. Folks, you're listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. We're talking about ho, ho, ho. How do you afford Christmas? with all the inflation of this last year. And plus, you know, we realize that you're probably all hosting Christmas and the holiday parties and and you've got more friends now than you did last year because, you know, COVID's over, right? So now we can start being together again. Well, how are you going to afford uh, buying all these presents this year? We're going to bring to you some more great holiday gift ideas and savings ideas here at Money on Tap. We'll be right back. For a number of our listeners, they have a lot of questions, and you might be one of them. Today, we're just offering what we call Zoominars, webinars over Zoom meeting rooms, where we have top experts, social security, estate planning, and financial planning experts for you to speak with, do a private consultation that way today. We're also having webinar-based Zoominars, where we're going to have multiple groups, where you can be part of that and enjoy that as well. Give us a call at 855 855- Two two six eight five five one, or email us at info at yourmoneyontap dot com to schedule your Zoominar. You can reach us at eight five five two two six eight five five one, or email us at info at yourmoneyontap dot com. And now more money on tap with Ben, Seth, and Dan. Welcome back. You're listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. We are talking about ho, ho, ho. Holy smokes now. <laughs> How do you afford Christmas this year? And, um, you know, one of the things that is a, a, just part of what we're doing this year, and we talked to the kids about this, and this actually is what they would like to do, and inflation does not truly affect this. It is actually gifting to organizations on behalf of people. 
So, you know, uh, supporting a child that needs school or needs some dental care or, or, or that's what's going on through the, the ministry or the missions organization, you can give those gifts to people. And you don't really have to worry about that stocking stuffer getting set aside and never used that year as well. So those are some ideas for you. How to, how to adjust for inflation this year. One area that I think is, um, and I know we didn't even talk about this, so I'm going a little off script, but I'll be safe. Cause, but, uh, you know, one of the things that you can do, too, with credit cards, with inflation and rates going up, contact your credit card companies because they will lock in your rate. They, they will do adjustments for your rate to keep your business. They, if you don't monitor them, they'll keep raising it and raising it and raising it. And you almost have to kind of call them and keep them in check. So if you're dealing with a kind of a higher interest rate or you just saw a bump, you can call them and say, hey, listen, you know, I'm just debating on moving my credit somewhere else. Are they happy to keep you around, especially when they know you've been an ongoing customer? Yeah, and if you're going to be in touch with your credit card companies too, the other thing to, to check out is to see if you have any accumulated points, right? You, yeah. you may have more value banked there based upon your shopping habits and the balances you carry you know, that allow you to get some kind of freebie gifts based upon those those accrued balances that you have. And sometimes credit card programs will have discounted sale items themselves you might have to get online to check that out but yeah. a lot of them these days do offer you know direct retail products at discounts so i have a discover card that i use and you know i get whatever one or two percent cash back and blah 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 but i can buy gift cards for places we're going to go shopping i mean we used to right. you know we used to do it for grocery stores Man. that they have what did you just say that you're giving gift cards but you don't like getting gift cards well now i'm doing it this year because of our new show <laughs> oh good okay. okay all right I'm following my advice. <laughs> and another thing, too, is uh, kind of the, the do-it-yourself gift or giving the gift of time. And, and this is one that, you know, I've always appreciated when it came my way. You know, the, you know some of the things that I saw as examples and times thereof, you know, offering to cook somebody a meal, you know, yeah. sit down, break bread, you know, come in with the food prepared. And, and a lot of people out there are more interested in the experience than – you know, unwrapping that gift that they'll never use kind of a thing. So you know, that's a good opportunity. Or, or if, you, if you know a couple with young children offering to babysit and kind of give, give them an opportunity to get a night out on their own, that's another big winner. I'll take that anytime. You too, if you're looking for ideas from me, uh, babysitting works. Okay. So uh, come on over. <laughs> okay. Done. I'll do that. All right. Yeah, babysitting. It's been, a while since, it's been a while since I've been asked to babysit another person's child, but that's okay. <laughs> My wife might think it's a bad idea on your part to offer that, but I, you know, I'll step in the void. <laughs> as long as I leave with three and come home to three, we're good. So that's <laughs> well, you know. Okay, so I'm going to give you. I'm going to give some kind of very, very drastic ideas for approaching Christmas for people who may really be struggling to figure out how to afford it in this in this environment, and they want to do something. So, first drastic idea is to not celebrate Christmas on Christmas. I know people that actually do Christmas on New Year's. They do Christmas on New Year's Day as a family, and they buy all their gifts from December 26th to New Year's, and they spend a very specific amount of money. That sounds very Canadian of you. I don't know why, but that sounds very Canadian. <laughs> very close. I'm very close to the border. So that's, 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 the, that's one thing that's very interesting. I also know people that just do Yankee swaps. We do a Yankee swap at our house for all the adults, you know, among our, you know, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law, everybody, we just do Yankee swap. Um, or we do name picking. It, it varies year to year. I'm not part of that voting pool. Never was invited to it. I'm just told which one I'm doing. <laughs> I've had a dear Aunt Mary who would run that program for us before she moved to Florida. But she, was, she ran this thing hard. But on, you had to show up at Thanksgiving with your gift, like clipped out of an, of an advertisement. Like you needed to physically bring what you wanted exactly. And then that will go into the hat, and everyone had a fifty dollar limit. And so you leave Thanksgiving knowing who you're going to buy for, what they're going to get, and who's buying for you, and what you're going to get, all predetermined. So it worked; it was functional, but it really killed the fun. You know, that's that was just one thing. <laughs> well, it would be funny. Yeah. It would I be funny if you to, put it in a Yankee swap. Now that would be funny. Yeah, it was, like, so you, you pull it, pull a name and the gift. So it's like the whole deal is just done. <laughs> well, so not yeah. exactly Yankee swap, but. Um, so we just went up that and we just said, go buy your gift and bring it to Thanksgiving and give it to the person that's going to give it to you. Yep. And there you go. That happened a number of times as well. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's, the, that's the first scenario. The second piece, which is a little less drastic, is the idea of, you know, when you're, when you're mailing gifts out, you know, 
or you're meeting somebody after Christmas for Christmas, buy your gifts after Christmas. It's just, it just makes a lot of sense. There's just so much wasteful spending in markups. They, these companies are just getting rid of stuff after Christmas. They can't get it off their shelf fast enough. You know, and I think that's going to be the one thing this year that will, will drive a lot in that space. Yeah, and another thing that we're attempting to implement this year in my family is, you know, as we've gone through the process of the, the price limit and the predetermined gift, um, you know, there's, there's a handful of children around, so they want to enjoy the spirit. And, and so everybody, all the kids are getting gifts. But, you know, amongst the adults, rather than kind of guessing at buying a bunch of stuff that either nobody wants or you, you have that, that kind of preset, predetermined, kill the fun kind of a concept, you know, what we decided to do is, you know, in the summer we take a trip as a family, so we're just going to pool all those funds, everything that we would have spent, you know, on adult gifts for adults. We're just going to go ahead and put it into that fund, and, you know, we'll use that in the summer. I like that idea. That's great. I love it. It's an experience, and it's something that uh, you'll always have versus that. I'm sure, Dan, you probably had a model airplane or something like that on your list that probably just really would wind up getting played with and broken anyway, so... We'll just bypass that whole process. It sums up my youth. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, if you are out there shopping and you're shopping online, we do have some uh, ways that we want to just advise you or make you aware of how not to do that. For one, public Wi-Fi. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a place where your information is not safe. And I want to just say the only way that, I, that I'm aware of to make that safe is, is if you are actually on a VPN, a virtual private network would be one way to make sure that your information is safe. Uh, but it's there's so many people out there just are unfamiliar with, you know, what being on a public Wi-Fi actually exposes you to. Um, I mean, it could be the person that's sitting there right next to you that's just grabbing hold of all of your information. Yeah, I think this is really one of those kind of things where, you know, Dan, you're talking about you start, you know, you're like a target. My phone never works when I'm in target. Don't know why. It just doesn't work. So I, I connect to their, the public Wi-Fi. It's the angels. It's yeah. the angels looking after you, Ben. And so, so I'll connect to that. But, you know, all of a sudden, if you are shopping for something and you're at a store and you're trying to do a price comparison online and you, oh, yeah, I'll just buy it right here. Boom, boom, boom. I'll, and all of a sudden you start inputting. Yeah, that's how you get exposed. And that is a big item, especially when you're kind of doing that cross. People, some people are listening saying, well, that's obvious. But for some people, it's just like, oh, I hadn't even thought about that. And I think that's important. Yeah, I mean, do the price check, but then go home to purchase it once you get on your own network. You know, don't just go ahead and punch in the credit card in public like that. You know, and as well, there's all these uh, kind of back-end scams that are sure to be bountiful this year where you're going to get these random calls and texts saying they're from a credit card company or from a retailer. And they're going to be asking you for personal information to verify a purchase you very likely didn't make. And you can find yourself in a trap there pretty quickly if they do get lucky and, and – you happen to get that bogus call purported to be from a retailer that you actually shopped at, uh, and you find yourself in a position where you're reauthorizing a credit purchase because you feel like it didn't go through, and it's the kind of the crunch of the holidays. You know, take your time with that. You know, realize that most of these companies don't call you directly, and if there's somebody that you do shop with frequently, just be aware of their you know kind of follow up procedures, whether it's the retailer or a credit card company. You know, they all have specific ways in which they will reach out to you and ways in which they will not. Uh, it's a good idea to pick a good way to pick up on a scam early on if they're contacting you through a means that you know that they just typically don't use. Yeah, these kind of like blanket emails that go out, you know, like they say, hey, listen, check your Visa card or check this. We get those all the time. But they're sending them out to millions and millions of people. And then they say, and they're hoping one person responds. And you may have just bought something at this store or done that. And it's just ironic. And you're like, and I do it too. I question them like, do I need to respond to this email? This looks exactly like what I just did. Yeah, no, that's a scary part. It, it's easy to fall into these traps, especially when you're, you know, it's December 24th and you've just made you know, 20 different purchases at 10 different stores and using three different credit cards. It, it can get confusing quick. Yeah. To protect yourself, one thing you can do there is uh, go ahead and get that free credit report and just pay attention. Have that one on hand and then you can do a comparison uh, shortly after the the um, the holiday, just to make sure that everything that you have there is still in line. Listening to Money on Tap, folks, it has been a journey for us today. Uh, we've been talking about ho ho ho. How do you afford Christmas? You can reach us at eight five five two two six eight five five one or info at yourmoneyontap.com. Uh, especially because there's so many other stories that we'd love to hear from you. 
and your experience of what you've been able to do with your holidays and how you've been able to save money because you know we we realize that there's only one aunt mary and that's dan's <laughs> and you might have somebody else in your family that's done exceptionally well at uh, helping the family out and having a great holiday safe holiday season folks we cannot wait to be back here with you again you're listening to money on tap make it a great week the views expressed are not necessarily the opinion of this radio station and should not be construed directly or indirectly as an offer to buy or sell any securities mentioned herein. Investing is subject to risks, including loss of principal invested. No strategy, product, material, or tool mentioned can assure a profit nor protect against loss. Please note that individual situations can vary. Therefore, the information, products, materials, or tools mentioned should be relied upon when coordinated with individual professional advice. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. This show may be subsidized in whole or in part by a product sponsor or issuer. Securities and advisory services offered through Sage Point Financial Incorporated, member FINRA SIPC, and a registered investment advisor. All other services offered through Brayshaw Financial Group, LLC, are independent of Sage Point Financial. Sage Point Financial and Brayshaw Financial Group do not provide tax or legal advice. Main office is located at 116 South River Road, Bedford, New Hampshire. 03110 and can be reached at toll free 855 226 8551.